so many different people, and I'm sure there were those who were not mentioned, Lord, but Lord, we know that you're able to do anything, and you're able to heal any disease, or you're able to help any situation, and Lord, we just ask that you would deal with these people and help them as only you can. Lord, more concerned about their spiritual condition, Lord, than any physical condition they have, Lord God, but we trust all of those things into your hand. Lord God, we just trust you and, and know that you're going to work in our lives to be able to help us and to be able to draw us closer to you. We pray that you do the same for each of these mentioned in prayer requests, Lord. Be with this church in the coming days ahead, Lord. Be with John Mays and his family, Lord, as they as they find a, a new home and a new place to serve, Lord. And, and Lord, just be with this church as they seek the one that would lead it and guide it as pastor, Lord, and, and help us to be able to uh, uh, discern and, and, and make right decisions that would honor you. Lord, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be in Luke chapter 14. <clears throat> so have you started, John? Or we're good? Okay. Luke chapter 14. Uh, John had asked me last week sometime to be able to uh, be prepared tonight, and I asked him, I said, do you want me to do acts, or do you want me to do whatever? And he said, just do whatever, you know, you don't have to continue on with acts. So uh, I'd been dealing with this passage of scripture through some of my own personal study, so I decided I'd share it with you tonight. Uh, Luke chapter 14, we're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to read down through 11. We're actually going to cover a whole lot of scripture tonight, so y'all... Y'all bear with me. I'm going to try not to wear you out, but we got a long way to go tonight. So, uh, Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 1, says, And it came to pass, as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace, and he took him and healed him and let him go. And answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit, and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again to these things. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden, when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, when thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, set that not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee, and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and set down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher, then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that set at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now, y'all have heard me say probably 50 times, if you've heard me say it once, that when we look at Scripture, we have to look at Scripture in context. We have to determine what it meant to the original audience, what did it mean to them, and it has to mean the same thing today. We can apply things a little bit differently because times are different. But whatever these parables meant to them, the same idea has to carry over into our world today. It can't have a different meaning. So that makes it all the more important to be able to understand the scene in which is going on here, where Jesus was, what he was doing, who was he talking to, all of these kinds of things, we have to figure that out to be able to understand, is he speaking a word of judgment to the Pharisees? Is he speaking a word of instruction to his disciples? What is Jesus speaking? Who's he talking to? Where is he at? What's the scene setting? What is going on around him? And once we understand that, then we are able to better discern what it is that these parables and things mean. Because if we look at a whole train of thought, and sometimes that's hard to figure out where these trains of thoughts go. Does your Bible have paragraph markers in it? You know what I'm talking about? It looks like a little backwards P, and it says, you know, here starts a paragraph. Well, the, the next time you see one of those, that's the end of a thought, and it goes on to a next thought, and that kind of thing. If y'all have that in your Bibles, you know, you know what I'm talking about. That helps you to find the natural outline and the way that things are broke down. But this is a long section, and it begins in Luke chapter 14, 
and it goes through Luke chapter 17, verse 10. It's all one big thought from front to end, and that means everything in the middle is connected. If it's all one big thought, one big scene, then we understand that all the parables in the middle have to be connected to uh, the idea of the whole story. The scene and the audience are crucial for understanding what these things are. This whole section revolves around an incident where Jesus goes to the chief Pharisee's house to break bread on the Sabbath day. Sabbath day, chief Pharisee's house, and here he is, he goes in, and it tells us that they were watching him. Now he showed up, and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do with him and, and, and what's going on and all of that, but what they don't know is that he's watching them. They're watching him, but he's watching them, and he knows all about what's going on with their heart and their mind, and he, he knows it all, right? So they think we're going to try and figure this guy out and what's going on, right? But all of a sudden it comes down to it that he knows all about them. By the time we get through this, we're going to, uh, to see that. So Jesus shows up, and there's a man there that has the dropsy. And I had to look that up. It's a swelling. It's edema where he's got fluid on his body or, or something like that. But Jesus asks, is it lawful to heal this man on the Sabbath day? And they just look at him like he's crazy. They don't say a thing. So Jesus heals the man, and he sends him on his way. And then he asks again, and he said, If you had an ox fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, would you not go and help your ox up out of the pit? I mean, surely this man is, is worth more than an ox, right? So, but they answer nothing. Silence, it tells us in Scripture. They give him no response and no answer. And from that, he begins a series of parables. All of the parables between there and chapter 17, verse 10, are all connected to the idea of what has just happened, that these men have no regard for the man who has the dropsy. They have no regard for their brother. They don't care about their brother. All they care about is themselves and their little party they got going on, right? They don't care about this man getting healed. If somebody showed up and said, we can heal you today, it's a Sabbath day. Yes, heal my brother, Lord. I've been praying for my brother. I love my brother. I want my brother to be healed, right? They don't say that. These men don't, won't answer a thing because they really have no regard for their brother. They have no regard for Jesus, and he is the one standing in front of them. And we're going to see, ultimately, that they have no regard for God's word. That's what happens when they say, no, I don't care if my brother gets healed or not, because love is the fulfilling of the law, right? They should have love for their brethren. They should have love for their brother in that way. So their neglect of the man with the dropsy, their neglect of their brother, shows that they have no regard for the word of God. I'm going to ask you to confront yourself with that idea tonight. What does my love for my brother say about how I feel about the Word of God? And how is that playing out in my life in practical situations? How is that being played out in my life? Do I talk a good game or am I really out there loving people and loving my brother the way that I should? Because that's what Jesus is confronting in this passage of Scripture is people that talk a good game, but they're not out there doing anything and don't really care about their brother. Amen. See, that's what he's confronting here in all of this. They're bound up in this false, self-righteous religion that God has no part of. And he don't really care anything about it. Because he's not even showing up at, the, at their functions because they can't have fellowship one with another because they're not walking as God would walk. So it's one of those things that we see, and I want you to, to, to think about that as we address this tonight. Luke chapter 14 and verse 7, notice who he addresses. He addresses all the guests at the party. It tells us in verse 7, he saw how they wanted the best seats, and he says, don't pick the best seat, you pick a lesser seat, and then your host will say, come and move up to a better seat, right? The goal is not to have the best seat, the goal is to put your brother first. That's the goal. If I take the less seat, then my brother's able to have the better seat, right? I should be more concerned about my brother than I am myself. I'd rather you have the better seat, Ryan. I want you to have this better seat. I'm going to sit over here and, and you take this better seat. What well, if the man comes up and says, no, I'd prefer you to sit up, that's fine. But I don't go sit in the best seat and put, make my brother last. I go sit in the least seat. And put my brother first. I put my brother before me. That's what Jesus is trying to tell them. 
Would you give up your seat for the man with the dropsy? If he come in here tonight, would you let him have your seat? Well, I'm the pastor. I got to have a seat. I'm the deacon, right? I mean, I'm, I'm going to be taking up the offering. I got to have a seat. I teach Sunday school. This is my church. I've been here 30 years. The man with the dropsy come in. Would you let him have your seat? You wouldn't if you're more important than him, right? See, that's where the Pharisees are. This guy's nothing. We're, we're, we're better than him. He don't need no seat at this party. Jesus says those who exalt themselves are going to be humbled, and those who humble themselves will ultimately be, expe- be, be exalted. In the kingdom of God, you put others first. Amen. See, that's what he's trying to teach. That's what he's trying to teach them. In the kingdom of God, you've got to put others first. Who's first in your life tonight? Who's first? For most of us, it's probably us, right? I mean, being honest, I mean, that's the first thing I worry about is me and what I'm going to eat and what I got going on and making sure my needs are met, right? I put all of that ahead of others. And I believe that's why the church has a reputation of not caring about those in need is because that is the attitude we have. We have little regard for those of a lower status. And whoever told you that lie, it was a lie. That's what it was. Because the ground is all even at the foot of the cross and we're all sinners either saved by grace or needing to be saved by grace regardless of what our sin is. Regardless of what your shortcoming is, we all come to the same place and we all receive the salvation, same salvation, the same deliverance from Jesus. In verse 12, Jesus turns and after addressing the whole crowd, he addresses his host and he criticizes him. Let me tell you, if you invite, you invite Jesus to the party, he might just ruin your party, Okay. Because he comes in here and and he criticizes the host. Look in verse 12. Then he said also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just." The host has invited his friends, his colleagues, his kinsmen, all of his neighbors and all of that so that hopefully one day when they have a party, they'll invite him to be able to go to, 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 to their party, right? They'll be able to repay the favor. See, it's all become a social club for the wealthy elite is what this all was in that day. It wasn't a, 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 a love feast like Paul would talk about where the Christians all gathered and, and had fellowship together. No, this was... This was all about the wealthy elite, and if you couldn't invite me to your party, well, I wouldn't invite you to mine, right? You know, that kind of thing is what they have going on. And Jesus says, you ought to be inviting the poor and the maimed and the lame and the halt and the withered and all of those people that can't repay your favor. You should be inviting people that need help, not inviting just people that want to, you know, uh, return the favor. So as a church, who are we inviting to suffer? We invite those that look like us, walk like us, and talk like us. Or are we going out and inviting the halt and the lame and the withered, the blind, those really in need of help? Some people have decided that they're going to have a feast. And you know who they've invited to their feast? The devil. They've let him come sit down at their table. They're living in sin. They ain't got no regard for their brother. They only got regard for themselves. They've invited the devil to come down and sit at their table for a little while. Who do you want to serve? I'm going to ask you that again here in just a little while. Who do you want to serve? In verse 15, we see that one of the guests is listening in as he addresses the host. And he gets involved and he understands. He says, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Right? Blessed is he. Blessed are those who will one day eat at God's table. Do you realize that for all of eternity you're going to sit down at God's table and eat? That he's going to provide everything you will ever need. You won't have to bring anything. You won't have to leave a tip. You won't have to come and put your credit card or anything. I mean, you're going to sit down at God's table and anything that you need, want, 
anything that you have is going to be given to you by him. You'll sit at his table. He's going to be the host. Think about this parable and the host and who he bid to come to the party. You're going to sit down at God's table. He's going to be the host. Who did God invite to his party? Right? Sinners. He invited everybody, but the Pharisees won't go. That's what the next parable is about. He invited the Pharisees, but they won't go. And the people at God's party are all the halt and the lame and the withered, the sinners. Those that need salvation. Those that need his help. You and me. That's who ends up at God's party. And Jesus responds in verse 16 down there. And I'm going to read all of these verses. He said, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto his servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of these men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. See, God has prepared a great supper. And he's invited all of these Pharisees and scribes, but they all had an excuse. You know what their excuse was? Their false religion. That's what stood in their way. That's what kept them from being able to go out and do what God wanted. The first excuse they had was land. Well, I bought a piece of land. See, that's a possession. Some people, their possessions are keeping them from going to sit down at God's table because they're too worried about what they have and what they want and what they're going to get and what they're going to buy with the money they have. They're too worried about all of that. The, the first excuse was their possessions. And the Pharisees are bound up in this. They're the rich ones, right? They've got all the possessions. They can throw their money around whenever they want to. The second excuse was an oxen. I've got oxen to prove. That's work. I'm plowing. Plowing's work, right? Well, I'm too busy to sit down at God's table because I'm too busy working, making a living and doing these things and my work is more important than, than what's going on over here in the kingdom of God. I mean, I've got to make a living, right? I've got to support myself. I've, I've got to do all of these things. Third excuse, well, I've, I've married somebody. I can't come. See, it's a relationship. Some people, their personal relationships are keeping them from going and sitting down at God's table because they're worried about those things more than they are the things of God. You can't be worried about your work or your money or your possessions or your relationships more than the things of God. The things of God have to take first place. See, we're too busy to go sit down at God's table. He's invited everybody, but we're too busy to go sit down and let Him take care of what we need. Those who were bidden, since they wouldn't come, he sent into the streets to go get the poor, the lame, and the blind. And he sent out into the highways and the hedges to be able to go get those. And he says that none of those which were bidden and refused to come, none of those are going to taste of my supper. And don't miss this. Jesus just told them that my father is throwing a party and you guys were invited, Pharisees, but since you refuse to come, none of you are going to be going to the party. We're going to have us a big old time, and y'all are going to be left outside. Y'all are not going to be at the party that my father is throwing. Why? It's all connected back to the way they treated the man with the dropsy. It's because they had no regard for their brother, and they had regard for themselves rather than no regard for their brother. It's all about the man with the dropsy. Everything from chapter 14, verse 1 to 17, verse 10, I'm going to show you as we have time, I hope, to get through so much of this. It all goes back to their treatment of that man with the dropsy and their refusal to say, yes, my brother needs to be healed. They don't care about God and his word. They don't care about their brother. And Jesus tells us it's all about how you treat the least of these. That is what he tells us other places in Scripture. You know, Jesus didn't come for the Pharisees, he tells us, over in another place in the Gospels over there. He says the healthy don't need a physician, right? It's the sick. 
The sick are the ones that need a physician. He came for these who are lame and blind. Who in today's world most connects with the Pharisees? It's the average church member. Fully believe it. The average church member is the one who most connects with the Pharisees in Scripture. And the Pharisees took the harshest rebuke of anybody that was given in Scripture. We have preconceived ideas about how we're supposed to worship, about when we're supposed to meet, about what we're supposed to do, about who we're supposed to serve and who we can serve, and not these people, but we can only serve these people, right? We walk by, I mean right by the halt, the withered, the lame, the hurting. We walk right by those people and we offer them nothing. And we just keep on going about our business. And we think that God wants us to be the special guest at his party. But that's not the way it works. We walk right in and we want the best seat. And in reality, many in the church aren't even going to the party. They've been invited, but they refuse to go. How did they refuse? They refused God's word. They, they, they didn't treat their brother right. They didn't put others before themselves. That's the mark. That's, that's, that's the sign of, of, of who's a true disciple. I'm going to show you that in just a minute here in the scripture. Is, is that they're putting others before themselves. That's what a true disciple does. Jesus' criteria for who's going to the party is, is uh, what have you done for the least of these? In that other scriptures we've, we've been talking about. How are we treating people that can't repay the favor to us? What are we doing with those sick and in prison, the prostitutes and the drug addicts and all of that? We can pat each other on the back all day, uh, all day long if we want to, and God's not impressed with that. He wants to know what are we doing for the least of these. And if the modern-day church is going to survive and be, be, be what God intends it to be, we've got to find a way to reevaluate our service model. We've got to start reaching out to people that need help, and we've got to do it in meaningful ways. We ought to have a burden for somebody. What happens at this point in the story is Jesus walks out of the party. You look at what happens down there in 25, it says, and there went great multitudes with him. So he told them what he told them, that wasn't none of them going to his party or his father's party. And then he turns and he walks out, and a bunch of people follow him. They go with him whenever uh, whenever he uh, uh, he walks out at that point. And as he is going, and I'm not going to read all of these because we don't have time, but as he is going, he tells them, you need to count the cost. Y'all know that parable where it says no man begins to build and doesn't first count the cost that he knows what it's going to take, right? It's not about building. It's about entering the kingdom of God and and don't start following me as my disciple if you're not willing to follow through is basically what he's telling them. Don't count the cost, or he's telling them to count the cost. Don't start out following me and then go and change your mind. Jesus says if you want to follow me, you're going to have to leave it all behind. All of that mess that you've got going on, all of that mess and falseness that you've been taught in your past, you are going to have to leave it all behind. Anything that stands in your way, you better get rid of it and you better follow me. That includes your mother. If your mother stands in the way, you're going to have to let her go. If your father stands in the way, if your brother, your sister, whatever it is that stands in the way, let it go. The Pharisees, what stood in their way and what stands in much of the church's way today is the religion. It's all that preconceived idea of what we think church and everything is supposed to be. It's about service is what it's supposed to be. That's what these parables are about. They're about service. They're not about what we do here. They're about service and who we go out and who we serve. Scripture tells us that we are to lift up the orphans and the widows, right? They're the most in need. Those who are true widows, they're the most in need. That's who we're supposed to be supporting and helping, those who are most in need. G. G. Campbell Morgan, a hundred years ago or more, said when the church ceases to lift Christ to the height that all men can see him, it becomes useless and a fraud. If we're not going out and serving people in the name of Jesus, the church has become useless and it has become a fraud. There are people all around us that have needs that need to be met. How are we going to meet them? I mean, it's a real, I mean, it's a genuine question I think the church needs to deal with in the days going forward and considering where we are right now. We need to determine how we're going to serve this community. And when we, because here's the important thing about that, the scripture tells us that when we minister to the least of these, 
we minister to Jesus. What you've done to the least of these, my brethren, Jesus said, you've done unto me. So if you're going to serve Jesus, you've got to serve the least of these, my brethren. See, it's all about the man with the dropsy. Chapter 15, you go into chapter 15, and again, we can't read all of these. You'll know these parables. The Pharisees are murmuring against Jesus, and the, the sinners, the, the publicans and the sinners draw near to him. Notice that there's a separation between the people who want to hear God's word and the people who are convicted by God's word and condemned by it. They go the other way and they start doing this number against Jesus. But the publicans and the sinners who are eager to hear this word and eager to repent and accept salvation, they all draw near to Jesus. There's three stories in Luke 15 about lost things. The first story is about a lost sheep. One goes astray, and Jesus leaves the 99 to be able to go after the one. And there is a rejoicing when it is found. There's great joy in heaven, it tells us, over one sinner who repents. The second story about lost things, there's a lost coin. There was a headdress that had ten coins in it, and one of the coins was lost, and it was a bridal headdress. The woman can't get married without her her proper adornment, right? And one of them's lost. It's got to be found in order for her to enter into her marriage and all of that. The house is swept clean. They light the candles and they look until they find it. And once they find it, there is, there is great rejoicing and even joy in the presence of angels, we're told, over one sinner who repents. The third story of something lost in this chapter is about a prodigal son, and we all know this story. The son asks for his inheritance and he goes and wastes it with riotous living. And when he comes back home, all he wants to be is a servant, right? He says, if I can just go be a servant in my father's house, right? Remember, servant. If I can just go be a servant in my father's house. But the father's been looking for him when he comes home, right? And the father takes him and he puts the robe on him, puts the ring on him, kills the fatted calf, and all of a sudden, what are they having? A party. See how it connects to the other parable? Who's invited to the party? The elder brother's not going to the party. The prodigal son, he's, he's going to be at the party. See, this is true conversion when you look at this. The prodigal didn't want the chief seat. He said, I'm going back to my father's house, and I hope he'll just make me a servant. If he'll just make me a servant, I'll be happy. If I can just go serve in my father's house, that's all I want. The father says, no, you move up. You take the best seat, right? Because you're my son. You were lost. You've been found. Great rejoicing. See, see the connection with all of this? The elder brother, the Pharisee, gets mad, right? The Pharisee's mad. I've never left you. Not once have I ever left you. I've been right here while that thing was out here wasting his money with harlots, sleeping in the pig pen. I've never disobeyed you, and you never even gave me a baby goat so that I could throw a little party with my friends. He wouldn't go into the party because he's mad about his money. This prodigal has gone and wasted his, and he's not going to come back here and waste mine. It's mine. He's done wasted his, right? See the connection between the Pharisees and all of this? See, the Pharisees have no regard for the man with the dropsy, and the elder brother has no regard for his brother. He hates him. He has no regard for him at all. And what Jesus did is he just put the robe and the ring on the man with the dropsy and the elder brother ain't going to the party. That's what he's just told them in all of these parables. The Pharisees have been seduced by money and by pride. How do I know? Because in chapter 16, Jesus gives two parables about money and he calls them covetous. That's what they're worried about. They're worried about the money. That's all they're worried about. In the first parable in chapter 16, he speaks to the disciples. You'll have to go read all of these verses. But he tells the disciples, look, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and mammon, for you will love one and you'll hate the other. So if you're going to serve money, you can't come and follow me and serve me. Right? You, you, you have to choose which one it's going to be. And then he says, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Right? And what I get from that is this idea. If you can't use your money to help the prodigal come to know Jesus, what good is it? If you'd rather sit on your money and hoard it 
and be able to sit there and feel good about your security rather than use that to be able to help a man come to know Jesus, you ain't going to the party either. That's what he tells us right here in these verses. That's what he told the Pharisees. Chapter 16, verse 14, he speaks to the Pharisees which followed him and are still watching. He calls them covetous and it says they sneered at him. He ain't going to talk about me that way. See, they knew he was talking about them. It done cut them to the heart. They knew he was talking about them. And look what he says in chapter 16, verse 15. I've, I've chewed on this verse all week. It's, it's just tore me up. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. You justify yourselves for men. What's our excuse for not serving? We justify ourselves. Well, I'm too busy. I got too many obligations. I got this. I got that, right? We justify ourselves. But God knows our heart. He knows if we really want to serve or not, or if we're just making excuses. Amen. Gets me. That which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. He's still talking about that money, that pride, that legalistic false religion that the Pharisees had. See, the things that they desire, God wants no part of. What does that tell us about the church today? What do we desire? Is it something God can be a part of? If not, there's a place we can fix that. That's right down here. We've got to figure these things out. And if I don't challenge you, or if the Word doesn't challenge you, or the Spirit doesn't challenge you, we'll never know where we stand. At that point, he gives the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. And so many people preach this out of context. They want to talk about what heaven's going to be like and all that kind of stuff. That's not what it's about. It, it, it's a parable about money. See, the rich man had it made on the earth, but not so in the afterlife, right? I mean, he's in hell. He hoarded up all his riches, and now he's in hell because he had no regard for his brother. The Lazarus, Lazarus was a beggar. The rich man's dog, it says, licked his sores. And I've always thought it interesting that the rich man's dog was more compassionate than the rich man. And all Lazarus wanted was to be able to eat the what the rich man threw away and wasted. Just the crumbs off his table was all the, all the poor man wanted. But he's now in paradise. You see, the money won't get the, par the Pharisees into paradise. That's what he's telling them. And I had this idea this week. I'd almost bet the, the, the man with the dropsy, I wonder if his name was Lazarus, after he tells this parable in the way that we see that it's connected. This man will one day be comforted and they will be tormented. And they'll want somebody to go back to their brothers and say, look, listen, listen, if we could do it differently, we'd do it differently today. But Jesus says, if one come back from the dead, you wouldn't listen to him. And it was fulfilled in Scripture after he died and was resurrected and come back, and the Pharisees and everybody still rejected him. They denied him. We're at chapter 17. We've come this far to find out the, the whole point that Jesus in all of this is trying to tell the disciples, okay? And he tells them in the first couple of verses, don't be a stumbling block to your brother. Don't be a stumbling block to anyone. It'd be better for a, for a millstone to be hung around your neck and you thrown into the depths of the sea than for you to get in the way of somebody coming to God and you be in the way, right? Don't set a bad example. Don't lead people astray. Literally, the word is don't trap your brother. Don't set a trap for your brother. That's what the, the Greek word means there. And then he says, those that have been a stumbling block to you... What you need to do is rebuke them, and if they repent, then you need to forgive them. So don't hinder anybody's walk, and if somebody's hindering your walk, you need to tell them about it and give them an opportunity to repent. And if they repent, then you can forgive those who have offended you. And if your brother repents, forgive him. 
How many times? Remember Peter asked three times? That seems like a lot when somebody's taking advantage of you, right? Three times. But Jesus says no. Seventy times seven. And then here Jesus says, as often as, as often as he repents, forgive him. Even seven times in a day? That's what he says. As often as he repents, you forgive him. Well, what if he's not appreciative? What if I get took advantage of? What if it costs me something? I mean, I work hard for what's mine, right? I'm not going to just throw it away and give it away out there and just, just waste it on them people. They've done took advantage of me five times today. Forget them, right? Is that our attitude? Jesus says forgive anyway. Just forgive them anyway. Serve them in the name of Jesus. You want to learn how to be humble? Wait till God asks you to serve somebody who's wronged you. When God asks you to serve somebody who's wronged you, you'll find out how humble you are and how obedient you're willing to be. Chapter 17, verse 5. Here's, here's what the apostles say. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. Lord, we can't do this. We can't love like that. We can't forgive like that. We can't serve like that. You're going to have to help us. Amen. When the church gets there, Lord, you're going to have to help us. As long as we got it all took care of and everything's fine, we're not doing anything. But when we get to the point where we say, Lord, we can't love these people the way that you can love them, why don't you teach us? Rather than me saying I got it all figured out, Lord, just increase my faith. Lord, help me to be able to do what it is that you would like for me to be able to do. And then we see that he gives them a parable in verse 7 through 10. And I'm going to paraphrase because we won't understand it if I read it anyway. I spent more time trying to understand this because here's the end of the train of thought. It started in 14.1 and it goes all the way through right here. This is the end of the train of thought. Here's what Jesus wants us to get through all of that that he's just been at the party, addressed the hosts, addressed the others, left the party, walked and told them everything as he was walking and going, and then now he's turned to the disciples, and here's what they were supposed to learn from the night's festivities, if you will. Here's where, he are, where we are. He says, there's a servant in the field working all day, and when he comes in, the master does not say, prop up your feet and rest, right? If you've got a slave and he's been out in the field all day, then when he comes home, you don't say, well, you've been working hard all day. Why don't you prop up your feet and rest? I'm going to cook you some supper, right? He's a slave. You don't treat a servant that way. You don't treat a slave that way. The master says, get to work. Aren't you going to make my supper? That's what Jesus says. He says, after he goes, he comes in all day. Jesus says, he says, you get to work. There's supper to be made. He doesn't thank the servant for his service. He's a servant. He's a slave. That's what he does. He's a servant. It's what he's supposed to do. Jesus tells the disciples, when you have done all that you have been commanded to do, you need to say, we are unprofitable servants. We're just doing what we're supposed to do. The whole point of all of this, you are a servant. That's what he told the disciples. You're a servant. Can't get around it. You're supposed to be a servant. You say, I'm tired. I need a break. They don't appreciate what I'm doing. I'm wasting my money. I'm wasting my time. I'm wasting my effort. I don't want to do it anymore. They demand so much of me. I have I've give all I can give. I just can't give anymore. Jesus says, so what? Go serve. Because that's the way I served you when I went to the cross and I gave everything I had for you. So when you're tired and you want to quit, you look at Jesus and you say, I think I can serve a little longer. That's what they're supposed to say. That's what they're supposed to do. Go serve in the name of Jesus. Don't be sucked into this Pharisee's useless religion because the Pharisees serve only themselves. You know, we don't serve for recognition and we don't serve to get our name in the paper or to be able to get a pat on the back and, or any of that. We don't want the best seat at the feast, right? 
We just serve because it's the right thing to do. And we should not be neglecting our brother who's fallen and who desires to repent and be restored. We should be trying to do everything we can to be able to see him get back up, right? Because the world is full of, of men and women just like this man with the dropsy that need to be healed, that, that just need somebody to, to give them a chance and to love them, right? Jesus says, and, and paraphrasing, true disciples will never be done serving the least of these. That's what he just told the, that's what he just told the, the disciples. You'll never be done serving. There'll always be somebody for you to serve. So go serve them. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Because here's the kicker. When we serve them, we serve Jesus. That's what the scripture tells us. When we serve them, we serve Jesus. Who is it that you would say, I'll serve anybody God wants me to serve, but not them? Not them. I will not. I'm not going to. I will not. I refuse. Lord, Lord, I want to serve these people. Let me serve these people. And he says, no, you got to go serve them. And you say, no, I'm not going to go serve them. I believe that's where the church is at today. Many churches have become Pharisees. As long as they look just like us and everything's fine and kosher, you know, we're, we're going to serve them. But anybody that don't fit that norm, I don't know. I'm, you sure, Lord? You sure you want me to go over there? One quick thing before we close. 1 John chapter 2. And this ties in. For people that wonder, 1 John is a book that helps us have assurance of salvation. It tells us several times, I forget how many times in the book of 1 John, that we can know that we are in him. How do we know that we are in him? One is we keep his commandments. Two is we walk as he walked. And three is, is that we love the way that he loved. Look down to verse 7, 1 John 2, verse 7. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because the darkness, darkness has blinded his eyes. Pharisees hated their brother. They loved their self. And they weren't going to the party. So I believe Jesus asks and, and tells us over there as we get through that, who are we going to serve? That's what he tells the disciples. You'll never be done serving. There's always somebody to serve. You've got plenty to do, plenty to serve. Just, just go serve them. If they wrong you and they're willing to repent, just serve them again. Just keep on. Just, just keep on. You say, I don't know where to start. Say, I'd like to do that, but I don't... I don't I don't know where to start. I saw this this week. You start where you are. Amen. You don't wait on that magical day when everything's going to be right and you can serve. You start right now, right here. You start where you are. You say, well, I don't have the resources. Well, you just use what you have. Because isn't our God uh, one who multiplies loaves and fishes and whatever? I mean, he's got the cattle of a thousand hills. He can... Do whatever he wants to do, right? You just use what you have. And you just do what you can. And you know what will happen when you do it in faith? Jesus will make up for the rest. Amen. Amen. He'll come alongside and make up for the rest. I hope this has challenged you tonight. It's challenged me this week. Or actually the last about two weeks. 
but I hope that uh, the church that rather than us seeing this time right now when we are without a pastor as a time of confusion I hope that maybe we can regain some focus and be able to find something that we can do to be able to go forward and to be able to serve in the way that the Lord would have us to serve so rather than us fall into disarray and confusion I think we should come together and we should focus and we should try uh, to be able to see what we can do to continue serving and even more so to serve than we have in the past the community and the people around us. Bless y'all.